Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning that we can gather and worship you. So Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts, invite you to be at this place at this time, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus took on all our pain, our sorrows and our sins. He suffered more than words can say, for all the hurt that's ever been. He knows how to comfort me, and He knows how to heal. I can turn to Him for peace. For he knows how I feel He knows every tear I cry And every time I fall My deepest hopes, my darkest times I know Jesus found them all He knows how to comfort me and he knows how to heal I can turn to him for peace For he knows how I feel No one else has suffered so Or bled from every pore No one else has given all No one loves me comfort me and he knows how to heal I can turn to him for peace for he knows how I feel The scripture reading for this Sabbath is taken from Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Let me read. And they said to me, the survivors who were left from the captivity of the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burnt with fire. Verse 4. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. May God bless the reading of the scripture. Good morning once again. Happy Sabbath. This quarter, uh, we are embarking on a new journey, a new series, and that is uh, the lessons from the leadership from the book of Nehemiah. Um, we are looking at, of course, this year, as we come to the second half of the year, we'll be looking at as well things like Things like uh, our nominating committee, nominating new leaders. And I think there is uh, something apt to consider because many times, right, we may be afraid of taking on leadership. And I thought there are some uh, lessons from leadership that we can learn from the Bible and hopefully it may encourage us to consider to take on leadership if God may call us to do so. And uh, as we look at this uh, title, A Prayer to be Studied, uh, th there's the title and title because uh, Ellen White talks about the prayer of Nehemiah as a prayer to be studied. And we'll be looking at that later. But before that, I would like to ask your thoughts, you know, we can ask you to scan the QR code at this moment. What are the attributes of a leader? Eh? 
uh, maybe I invite you to take out your phones and scan the QR code and fill in your responses. Uh, you can fill in on behalf of others also who don't have a phone. I invite you to scan and fill in some of the, what are some of the attributes of being a leader? What are your thoughts of uh, the attributes of being a leader? Okay, let me see. So as you fill in, uh, let me try to log in as well and take a look. Good. All right, so as you fill in, there are some different kinds of leaders. Right? There are leaders that are chosen by position. So leaders that, for example, my position as a pastor is a chosen leader, leaders who have designated authority. But the reality is that because I'm serving all of you who are volunteers, you all have a freedom of choice, right? If I tell you, please be a leader, your answer can be, no pastor, I don't want to do. Right? That could be your answer, right? Because we are not, there is no force, there is no authority that, is, that may be truly there. Unlike in your workplace where your boss says, okay, you need to do this task, then because you need to get paid, you don't want to be fired. So in a sense, there is the authority that says, okay, I have to do it, and then we may choose to do it. So that is a one kind of leader. Another kind of leader could be one, uh, that, that is done through influence by persuasion. So they may be convincing others of their position, uh, and as they, they do so, other people think, ah, that it makes a lot of sense, and then they choose to do so. And I think that is uh, quite often something that uh, we do in church, right? Build relationships with people, uh, try to sell you the good idea and vision, and say, let's do this together, right? As a, more of an influence and journey together. There's another kind of leader, and of course, there are different kinds as well. So let me take a look at some of your answers this morning. Uh, okay. In a moment, I'm trying this out with my phone instead of my laptop to see. Yes. No, 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 that is the second question. Perhaps there are two different questions. Uh, is it mistaken? Give me a moment, I think. Uh, let me give, a, give me a short moment to correct it. Huh? I think there are two questions this morning and perhaps uh, it might have jumped to the second one already. So let me um, try to make some corrections here this morning. Uh, we have, what are the different attributes of being a leader? Okay, can we try that again? Does it work now? Yeah. yeah. There are, there's actually the same link, but uh, two part questions. Huh? So we try to come back to the first one again, if you can, uh, to answer. Perhaps I think I might have left it at the first one. We will come to the second one shortly that you have already answered. Okay, what are the attributes of a leader? Thank you. We'll take a look. No wonder I cannot see any responses. I thought my phone was bugging out. Thank you, Pastor Chan, for letting me know that we were on the wrong slide in the voting. Is it working now? I hope. Yes, thank you. All right, so we have some answers before us, uh, such as honesty, influence, visionary, accountability, being brave, uh, other answers such as, let's take a look, persistence, service, kind, perseverance, leading by example, and uh, so on and so forth. And of course, I have uh, my favorite fan always putting my name there uh, in all these answers. <laughs> okay, uh, so, yeah, we have, there are many different answers, and I thought these are different as aspects of leadership that we look at. Uh, some of them we will be looking at this quarter, uh, leading by example, having vision, uh, serving, uh, persevering, and are different areas which we will look at this quarter, and I thought uh, these are something that we can think of. We often think of leaders in all these different aspects. Right? Uh, we, we think of uh, leaders that have vision, we think of leaders that are here, the first few biggest things that stands out, I mean, some more of you put it, are responsible, visionary, 
empathy. Ah, I think it's interesting. And of course, commitment is the next one. I think it's interesting to see that we value leaders, ultimately, who are, have a direction and vision, who are responsible, those who have empathy, and those who commit. And that is an uh, interesting thought that we have. The next one, uh, if we may take a look, it's actually in the same question. You can just press the next button or scan again if you have. If God called you to be a leader, what is your response? I think this is a thought because many times, right, we, we say, how will I know if God calls, right? Our answer is, oh, that one is the church call me or the pastor call me or the nominating committee call me, right? Not God call me, right? That's sometimes our reason and excuse. Uh, I think there's something that we can, of course, pray on and uh, ultimately we will know between us and God. Sometimes our answer may be to God. Will our answer be send someone else, right? Like Moses, when God called him to be a leader, he said, ah, not, I'm so old already, I'm not good in speaking, Lord, send someone else. Right? Sometimes that could be our answer too when we answer God. We say, God, why me? I don't want to lead, you know. Can you just send somebody else? I don't want to do it. Sometimes our answer may be, wait, Lord. Lord, you, every time I pray to you, your answer is wait. So I tell you, God, my answer to you is also wait. Uh, next time when I grow older, then I will come back. When I have achieved things in life, then I will come back. Right? So, so perhaps that could be our answer. Or perhaps we say to God, no, uh, not for me. Uh, this is not, I don't want to do it. Or if our answer could be yes, and Lord, as Isaiah might have said, here I am, send me. And of course, in our GC uh, vision, that it talks about this couple of years, is I will go. That could be our answer. And as I look at the responses here today, uh, we have a good number, uh, 33 people answered, I will go, 34 now. And uh, eight people answered, send someone else. Nine people answered, wait. And two people answered, no. And the rest, I think, uh, dare not answer, but it's okay. At least we do have a good number who dares to say that I will go. And I think that is something that is important. Uh, if we are struggling with it, if we are thinking about it, it is something that God is calling us to reflect upon. Right? When he, the question we ask ourselves is, are we daring to pray to ask God when He calls us? Sometimes when we ask people, we ask people, pray about it. Then they say, I don't want to pray. I know what God's answer is. Right, you know, the, the kind of idea is that we don't want to accept his call because if I pray already, I know he will call me, so therefore, I don't want to pray. That's sometimes uh, our answer. Or could it be at other times we may say, Lord, I don't, can't see your response. I must give you a very difficult test so that I make sure that it's very hard for you to answer, then I don't have to answer your call. Perhaps that might be uh, also sometimes our ways to do some of these things. And I think I did share the last time, right, that while I uh, gave a call, test to God in terms of healing me from my eczema, ultimately I realized that was just of my own self and that was not what I needed in terms of the answer. What I needed was the assurance that God would be with me and that there was something in terms of responding. And I think that's something we can also consider when we talk about leadership on when God calls us. Perhaps we may not always necessarily need to see signs that He has chosen us, but we may perhaps need to consider that as long as His presence is with us, as God says, as long as you are, I am with you always, as long as we have the assurance that He is with us, do we dare to then step off in faith and say that I will go, I will answer the call of leadership. This morning, as we look in the idea of leadership, I'd like to present it from a different point of view in that leadership, although we have mentioned different roles about appointment, uh, about those who have appointed authority, those who should influencing others, I'd like to come from the point of view that leaders are those who influence others. Leadership is using my influence for a worthwhile cause. We may ask the question, right, can everyone be a leader? I think the answer is yes and no, because not everyone will be an appointed leader, but everyone is leading in one way or another, whether not appointed. Because we all have influence in one way or the other, right? We have influence in our homes, we have influences where we are. And some of us say, ah, we have reasons like, I am super introvert, I wouldn't dare to lead. How can I do such a thing? And I was looking at the uh, article in Psychology Today. It says over our lifetime, even for very introverted people, we influence about 10,000 people. 
on average. So I thought that's very interesting because we don't, often don't know our influence, right? Many times we will only know our influence when we get to heaven, right? When people come and say, oh, because of what you did, now I'm here in heaven. Or perhaps for people with longer ministries, like our pastors here, Pastor Chan, Pastor Yuan, or Pastor Mani, you may have people who come to you after many years and say, oh, back in the day, I remember you touched my life in this way or that. Right? And that is part and parcel right, of using our influence for a worthwhile cause. But we ask ourselves, if everyone lead, then who follow? And if we look at that idea, it's the same idea as if someone sells, everyone sells something, then who will buy? But if we look at it in another way, the person who sells food, people will go there and eat. The person who sells clothes, the person who later need to buy clothes, the one who sells food, will buy from the one who sells clothes. So what I'm trying to say is, each of us have our own sphere of influence. Each of us has something that God has called and put in our heart that we may find passionate about, that we may find that we may be able to lead in certain areas. Right? Not all may lead in the same areas, but God has called us to lead in areas which He has placed in our heart. And so leadership in that sense is using our influence for a worthwhile cause. Then another person may argue, Jesus said in the Bible, follow me. So we are called to be followers, not leaders, right? Some of us may argue in that way. But Jesus did say, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Right? He called us to lead others, right? not just to follow others. Likewise, in the Bible, when God created man, He created us to make him in his image. What does that mean, per se? When we are called to be in his image, he also called us to rule over all the fish, the animals, and the sea. Right? There is the idea of leadership that God has called us to rule over and dominion over the other uh, living creatures. So leadership, in a sense, God has created us both to follow, yes, to follow Jesus, but also to lead. Follow Jesus and he will make us fishers of men. So there is a two-part it. All of us have roles in following and also roles in leading. Right? We can't lead forever. We have also have to follow at times. Just as we can always sell things, we also have to buy from others. So there is the idea that leadership is using my influence for a worthwhile cause. And what is that worthwhile cause? I think that will determine on what God has placed in our heart, something that we want to lead, something that we want to share with others, something that we want to influence others. Right? When we are excited about something, we tend to want to share with everyone. Right? Some of us who are excited with certain movies, certain dramas, certain stories, certain cheap products, certain sales, then we tell everyone, come, come, buy, this is the best product, come and buy, I want to share with you. Right? So whatever that excites us and interests us, that may be the thing. But of course, when it comes to spiritual things, we all too also have our own niche. Right? Some of us may be interested in music. Some of us may be interested in landscaping. Some of us may be interested in befriending others. And how some of us may be interested in health and so on. Right? There are many areas in which God can place in our heart to lead others. But today, we come to the topic of Nehemiah. And when we talk about leadership, Seldom we think of the idea of prayer, right, as a form of leading, right? I didn't see that in the answers. And I thought that is something that is worth our attention. Because when we look at the lessons of leadership from the book of Nehemiah, the first thing that pops up in Nehemiah 1 is the idea of prayer. But before we come to that, let's first take a look at the story that is before us. So Nehemiah was a cup bearer to the king, King Artaxerxes of Medo-Persia. Uh, being a cup bearer had... Uh, important prominence because the king before him also was a, a affected or killed, murdered by one of his court attendants. And so the, the one who was the cup bearer would often have to drink uh, of whatever the king were to, to drink so that if they were poisoned, we know the cup bearer will die first and the king will be spared. He would also have default important positions, often being an administrator, running some of the important roles. It was a trusted advisor that the king would also consult. And Nehemiah was placed in that position of leadership. And he was placed there. And God had a purpose for him. As he was there, his friend Hanani uh, came to visit him. Uh, before that, we see. Uh, uh, Nehemiah was both a cup bearer and his role, uh, his name, means the Lord comforts. 
Nehemiah's name represents of his hope and his belief in the strong promises that God will indeed comfort them, that he will restore to them what he has promised them, that their loss of their beloved place, their beloved city of Jerusalem, that God will fulfill his promise and comfort them for their loss that they had lost to the Babylonians. And so his name reflected that and his purpose there to lead them back to rebuild the city. Next, we have his friend Hanani who came by. His friend, or rather, sorry, his brother Hanani uh, came to visit him. He was on the way from Jerusalem and he came to visit uh, Nehemiah. As he visited him, Nehemiah inquired about how Jerusalem is, what's going on, and to understand the context, uh, there had been two different times when the children of Israel had already gone back to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, Ezra being the second one. And he had been over 20 odd years since they had done so. And Nehemiah now was interested to know what had become of Jerusalem. Of course, we know, unlike today, they don't have easy means of communication. And so when he came to visit him, he shared what was happening. Hanani's name means the Lord is gracious. So God is gracious to them. In spite of all their struggles, God was still gracious to them and he did not forget them. He came all the way from Jerusalem and shared the state of affairs of what it was. It was a distressing situation. It was one where they felt that they, the city was in great distress and reproach because the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down and the gates had been burned with fire. This had happened during the time uh, recorded in Ezra chapter 4 where the people were rebuilding their city and because of the other rebels that were there at that time, uh, the protests of Rehum and Shimshai, the other people around who were jealous of the Jews who were rebuilding their temple, rebuilding their city, they had managed to convince the king that these people, the Jer people of Jerusalem, were a rebellious nation. They said, look at their history. Oh, they always rebel against you. They won't pay tribute. They won't be a good thing. If you let them build their walls, they will soon break away. And so with that, all that conspiracy and all these things to try to stop them, the king had been convinced back then and he, the same king, had written a decree to force them to stop building. And that city that was building halfway, that was then broken down and burned with, gates were burned with fire and they were in great distress and reproach because their beloved city which they had gone back to build all these years ago was still laying in ruins. The, the God's house which they were supposed to build back the temple was not built and years had passed. They, when Nehemiah heard this news, he wept. He was sad because he felt for his people. He mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And there was the, the often the things that was done in the time of the Old Testament where the people would uh, fast, they would pray, but there was their usual response to such situations that were very terrible. And as Nehemiah was doing this, uh, mourning, fasting, and praying, he was first seeking God as the answer. Now remember, Nehemiah was one of the top in there, just as the cup bearer to the king. He could have straight away, went to the king straight away and tell the king, oh king, please help us. Right? He could have done that. Right? He was in his power to talk to the king directly, to ask him to write a decree. That would have followed the other answers that we have. Uh, leadership is being responsible, to have vision casting, and so on and so forth, which is needed. But Nehemiah remembered being a leader, a spiritual leader, different from that of a worldly leader, starts with prayer. And Nehemiah, though being in the highest courts, chose to start with prayer. And I think that is very important for us to note because when we think of leadership, we rarely think of prayer, right? As we see, we wasn't mentioned. But when we need to think of spiritual leadership and as people who are people of God, even in our workplace, we need to have them taught today. And perhaps if we have not had the thought, we need to insert that thought that leadership, especially spiritual leadership, starts with prayer. Before all other things that are important, which we will be studying in the next couple of weeks, it starts with prayer.
one thing that we can learn here is that in the Mrs. Wright writes here that Nehemiah humbled himself before God, giving him the glory due in his name. Thus also did Daniel in Babylon. And he, she urges us, let us study the prayers of these men. They teach us that we are to humble ourselves, but we are never to obliterate the line of demarcation between God's commandment-keeping people and those who have no respect for the law. So what she's telling us is that you look at these two people. Daniel, right, was one of the top three men in Babylon. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. They could just use their power and influence to get things done. But they, before getting things done, chose the path of prayer. They chose to pray first before executing all their first important leadership attributes. And she urges us to study it, which we will take a look today as well. But most importantly, to humble themselves. Right? To humble themselves. And the question for us, of course, is when we come to the Lord in prayer, what is our posture in prayer? Right? We, of course, have the usual prayers. We pray morning and evening. We pray, uh, in our, we pray during meal times as well. We, of course, pray uh, for people. Right? Generally, we have a host of requests for the Lord. We pray uh, in different aspects. But there is something important, right? that we will take a look. When we consider, we have all kinds of prayer, right? This week in prayer meeting, Pastor Chan shared about praying uh, while walking along the way, praying while going about. That is our prayer, our breath of the soul. That is important as well. But today we will look at another aspect of prayer. And before it jumps into the different things, Nehemiah 1 verse 5 tells us of Nehemiah who petitions before the Lord to appeal for a hearing. I thought... That is quite different from how we would normally pray or I would normally pray. We would just go straight to the matter and tell God, God, uh, this is my X, Y, Z, A, B, C request or God, thank you for this and that and then we submit our request to Him. But Nehemiah appeals to God to listen to their prayer. I felt that when reading this, it was looking at the relationship between that of Nehemiah placing himself as his servant and God as a king, right? Many times in our prayer, right, we may sometimes pray like as if God de deserves to answer our prayer, right? God, this is my request, please answer it. But there is a different way that Nehemiah has chosen to approach, and that of a servant approaching a king. I think perhaps in uh, important prayers, that is definitely the way that we can learn from him. Of course, there are all kinds of prayers, but in such important things of serious matters, we can learn from Nehemiah. Here he says, And I pray, O Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants. He has placed them as the servants of the Lord. Right? He didn't come as one who deserves an answer. He didn't say, we are your people who have obeyed you or we are your people who you have promised to deliver. He didn't come from that point of view as you have promised in the Bible and how come your promise is still not restored? He didn't come from that point of view. But he started to petition on behalf of God to please open his eyes, open his ears and hear and be attentive. He started for appeal as a servant to a king to grant the request favorably. I thought that posture of prayer is important, especially when today, uh, there is, a, of course, a dynamics, right, between uh, more extreme ways and uh, 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 such as uh, community-based and non-community-based. What do I mean by that is, in the time of Nehemiah, the period of the kings were over. And in the period of the kings, whatever the king says, everybody must do, right? If they don't do, maybe they die or whatever like that, right? But in the period of the Nehemiah, times have changed. They cannot force anyone to do anything. He can only convince people. He can only persuade people. He can only influence people, as we mentioned, of leadership. And Nehemiah now, as in praying, is showing an example to influence the others to also do likewise. He's trying to influence others that, God, we are your servants. It's not because that you have not fulfilled your promise, or, but we are your servants and you remember us because you are our great king. 
And that is his appeal for them. The first step I think is important for us is he comes in the prayer, in the attitude of confession. And confess the sins of Israel, children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. It is very easy for Nehemiah to have said, the children of Israel have sinned against you. Our pe- the people have sinned against you. That's why you have not uh, come back to rebuild the city. But notice, Nehemiah includes himself. He says, we have sinned against you. And he even specifies that my father's house and I have sinned against you. He does not exclude himself from the equation. He does not try to pass it on to others, which is a tendency of human nature. Uh, yeah, it's their fault. So what can I do? You know, the people do it like this. But he, as a leader, he involves himself as part of the confession. Part of the issue that he's facing is because he also has sinned against the Lord. And I thought that is important because we know in coming to God, it is always to make clear the way, confessing our sins so that nothing will be between us and Jesus is a very important step. He says, We have acted very corruptly against you, and you have not kept, we have not, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have committed or commanded your servant Moses. God, here, Nehemiah is doing something that is really different from, uh, from most of the prayers that we are used to the idea of confession. And I'd like to share a story. I don't know if any of us have heard this probably a couple of weeks ago. Show of hands. Yes, no. No one. Okay. All right. The story here uh, goes of uh, this person. Uh, pardon, I have no idea how to pronounce. Chun Don Hwan. And of this grandson of a former South Korean dictator. This was reported in the Street Times. I believe it was uh, on 31st of March. There was... Uh, his grandfather was a former dictator during the time of 1980. And there was a place called the Guangzhou Uprising where he had taken over the country through a military coup. And there was university students who had come to do, uh, who had come to protest. But that day, uh, in May, on May 18, what happened is through the protest, he ordered the military to kill hundreds or possibly thousands of innocent students that day. And of course, the people were all very upset and all the families who had lost their loved ones, they had been upset. But all the way throughout their family's history, they had never once claimed that they had done anything wrong. And the people, the families had always felt the sense of injustice and so did the general populace in the country. There was that violent suppression there. And all the way until that grandfather's death in uh, 90, in November 2021, he never once apologized for it. However, this grandson of his, who recently came back, he started to apologize. And he said, I'm sorry it took me so long to get here. And it was not only a once-off because he had started off his apology that he'd been sharing of his that he was sorry for what his grandfather had done. Now you think about it, right? This is his grandfather's problem, right? Why does he have to apologize on behalf of him? But the fact that he chose to do so and acknowledge that what they had done was wrong helped to move the hearts of the families and the families invited him because he had never dared to go to that place there uh, where they had caused the death of the people because he felt that uncomfortable because of what his grandfather has done. But because of his apology, the families invited him to please come, come to the graves and apologize in front of everyone so that there is that sense of closure. Here, of course, there are public, they are always they are divided in opinion, but the fact that he had, uh, he had acknowledged it, that what they had done that his grandfather was, he, he called a mass murderer, and it was not just a one-time thing. And because his testimony of apology was not just a once-off thing, the families were moved, and they also said that he will also start to repay the different things that they had owned. Because they had different illicit funds that was accumulated during his grandfather's time. And before he died, he was due to pay almost $100 million 
for various crimes which they were to do. And so then with looking at his apology there, apologizing on behalf of his grandfather helps, at least for some, to find closure, to invite him to, to, to apologize there in front of the graves for the people and of course start to make amends for what they did. Uh, we do not know, of course, the rest of the story, but now at least I thought the concept there of apologizing on behalf of others or apologizing in behalf of the family is an interesting concept because even though he didn't do anything wrong, as a leader, he still considered what his family, his grandfather has done wrong was also part of his role to apologize. And I thought that is how Nehemiah views that as well. As the people who had done wrong, he doesn't just push everything to the people and say, ah, this is your mistake. But rather he associates himself with the people and says, we have sinned, including my father's house and I. We see that in uh, here in uh, volume 3, SDA Bible Commentary, continuing from uh, in the same page. Not only did Nehemiah say that Israel has sinned, he acknowledged with penitence that he and his father's house had sinned. That is what uh, we have read earlier. We have dealt corruptly against thee, he said, placing himself among those who had dishonored God by not standing stiffly for the truth. We see here the importance of confession, right? even on behalf as a leader, on behalf of our families, as a leader on behalf of our ministries, of our church, a leader on behalf of the people who are under our care and our influence. Perhaps confession is definitely the first step we must consider in approaching God as we look to learn from the lessons of the book, from leadership from Nehemiah. The second is to look at the covenant promise. In Nehemiah 1.8, after confessing, he says, Remember, I pray, the word you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you will cast out to the furthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from here, there, and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. God's promise to them is that he will gather them. And that was the same promise that he did, he said, to the different people of Israel throughout different generations. Though they were scattered, he will gather them, right? Jesus said, though the sheep, they all scattered, he saw the people of Jerusalem scattered, but he, as the good shepherd, would gather them. Though they had been scattered because of the conquering of Babylon, and they were now in different parts, Jesus, God says that he will gather them. Though they were scattered because they were the slaves of Egypt, God delivered them from slavery and brought them out of Egypt. Though they were the huge diaspora that they had, God wanted and always promised that he would gather them back to where they belong in Jerusalem. And in the time of Jesus, where the people outside Palestine were actually greater in number than those in Palestine, still Jesus promised, as mentioned, that he will gather them. And that was in spite of their unfaithfulness. God's covenant promise did not change, right? That he was there to offer that to them, to offer to gather them back together. So since Jesus or since God had offered that covenant promise, their response is to request. Request and claim that promise. But requesting in a way, they say, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Here, Nehemiah was asking for mercy on be in front of the king, Arthur Xerxes. He was asking that God would see favorably upon him in his prayer. Because he knew it was not his position that mattered, but it was God who was with him that would make the difference. He claimed the promise that as God had promised to restore and gather the people back, he was claiming that covenant promise, requesting for God to act on behalf of that. And then the question we can ask ourselves today, likewise, is what is God's promise for us today? He has promised that as an end time movement, that we will proclaim the three angels' message and the outpouring of the latter rain that He has promised. Perhaps we can also claim that promise 
and we will see right, the change in our hearts, the changes in our church, the latter rain, the outpour, we'll see just as the early rain, transformation of people, transformation of hearts, people coming, seeing the love of Jesus in our church and in our hearts. What is it that we are called to claim both for ourselves and also as the last day people, as Adventists? Sometimes when we claim God's promises, we can be fearful. We can be saying like, we may sometimes pray prayers that we feel that if God can answer or even if we can do with our own strength we just ask god i'm going to do this uh, please bless what i'm going to do or sometimes we don't dare to pray things that are too miraculous because we haven't seen miracles we just pray for something and just ask god to bless our plans oftentimes in the 21st century we tend to do that but i think a recent story uh, in the adventist news there uh, reminds us that god is still continuing to work miracles i believe not only in africa but also in singapore and I'd like to share this story with us today to encourage us that when we claim God's promise, it needs not to be something that we can only do by our own strength. It can be something miraculous. But of course, it all starts with our faith. The story of this person named Kamu and Pastor Yetna. Here, Kamu had entered uh, the pastor of her Bible teacher's office heavily breathing. And since the beginning of the year in 2022-23, he had, the pastor had been the chaplain of, in charge of the English and bilingual section of the Bible teacher at Kosendai Adventist University in Yaoundé, capital of Cameroon. And the 12-year-old student, a student in Form 1, she had become attached to him in a short time and surprisingly, in a surprising ways. Just in a few weeks, he had been teaching her about dialogue in the dialogue with God in prayer and to claim and rely on his promises by faith. One day when he saw Kamo, he immediately knew that something was wrong with her. She was clutching her chest and having a great difficulty in breathing. And so he was helping her to sit up. And she said, Sir, something is wrong with me. She said, and he said, Please tell me what is bothering you. And the girl said, Sir, I've been told, I haven't told you this, but I have a serious problem with my heart. And so he, the pastor listened attentively as she narrated with tears in her eyes of her ailment that a few months earlier, a specialist had told her parents that she had a heart problem that required urgent surgery. And that happened after she had fainted and she was taken to the hospital there and there had been a trip already planned for her heart surgery in Italy. She says, every time I feel so sick, I feel as if my heart is going to stop. He says, sir, I think I'm going to die soon. And that scares me a lot. The pastor left his chair and claimed to hold her, the girl's trembling hand. And she said, he asked, do you think this disease is enough to kill you? He said, oh yes, sir, I feel it inside me. I feel that I'm going to die. And so as the pastor looked at her, her and he said, I understand. And he said, do you think it is so powerful and it's so bad that God cannot do anything about it? The girl hesitated to answer. And so the pastor who did not want to embarrass her immediately spoke again and said, here is what I propose we do. We pray, you and I, we will pray one after another every morning when we wake up and every evening when we go to bed in our various homes, we will pray so that God will heal you. And you will come to see me every day after school so that we will continue to pray together. And I believe with all my strength that God can heal you. And He can heal you and save your young heart from being operated on. Only that can happen unless you believe it with all your heart. Can you do that? And she, she agreed, although she later confessed that she said yes only just because the pastor said so, not fully believing. And so the pastor arrived early that Monday morning to come together to pray with her and open his office. It had only been a few weeks since they, were, they knew each other. And they had been praying for the last few weeks together. 
And that morning as she came, he barely sat down and she came rushing in and literally fell on his soldiers and said, Pastor, I've been waiting for you today since 6 a.m. And without sitting down, he, he said, oh, she said that they had went to the follow-up visit over the weekend. And the heart surgeon had asked what they had done because the heart suddenly became completely normal. And they asked, what did you give her? They asked the parents several times. And so, God indeed, because they had prayed diligently every morning, every evening, God had worked a miracle on behalf of her. Shall we say amen to that? Sometimes we look at life and we often pray, as I mentioned, things that we can do with our own hands. That is not truly prayer, right? Prayer is submitting to God things that we cannot do for ourselves. And when only the divine can do it for us, that is the true power of prayer. Now, of course, we have all kinds of prayers we mentioned earlier. But to claim, once again, talking about the covenant promise, to do something on behalf of us that seems impossible as a leader, that belief, that faith in prayer, is first the most important. It says, by faith taking hold of the divine promise, Nehemiah laid down at the footstool of heavenly mercy his petition that God will maintain the cause of his penitent people, restore their strength, and build up their waste places. God had been faithful to his threatenings when his people separated from him. He has scattered them abroad among the nations, according to his word. And Nehemiah found in the very fact an assurance that he would be equally faithful in fulfilling his promises. Nehemiah laid upon the Lord in the eye of faith, claiming his promises. And God answered him. We will study that more in the next coming weeks of how God answered Nehemiah's prayer. But today, what we can take home is that indeed faith is very important in order that in asking, requesting for God's prayer. And we ask ourselves today, as leaders, perhaps of our families, in our workplace, in ministries, and wherever God has called us to lead, whether officially with position or unofficially through influence, God has called us as leaders to pray, to believe that that is the first thing we need first before the other aspects of leadership. In prayer, to seek God in confessing, in claiming His covenant promises, that is what the Lord has called us to do. We may take a first step. It may not be easy for us to do it straight away, but perhaps we may take our first step today, confessing to the Lord, claiming His promises that sometimes we may not truly believe by faith just as the little girl, but by belief in prayer that we will grow in Him and as leaders, we will also grow in Him. How many of us would like to take that first step in prayer in these aspects of confessing, claiming a show of hands? How many of us would like to take that first step together in praying? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have shown us beyond all things that leadership starts with prayer. And oftentimes, as much as we talk about it, we, including myself, often don't pray enough. Father, help us to have a change in heart, to dedicate a bit more time specifically in prayer. Because we know that now, indeed, the most important, before all other things, is to start with prayer. We ask your Holy Spirit to strengthen us as we desire to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father in heaven, we claim by your prom carbon promises from our heavenly Father. And we confess in the name of Jesus that we indeed have sinned against you. By the strength of your Holy Spirit, may we claim your promises which you have promised in our lives and for our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.